Hello, my name is Anthony Fernandez. I am a dermatologist and a dermatopathologist at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm going to be talking to you today about optimizing co-management best practices for psoriatic diseases. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Elaine Husney, who is a rheumatologist here at the Cleveland Clinic, with whom I co-manage many patients with psoriasis, and Dr. Husney and I prepared this presentation together. Our presentation will follow a case, and our patient's initials are AH. She's a 42-year-old esthetician who presents with acute polyarthritis affecting her hands, knees, and ankles. She did have a previous rheumatologist who treated these symptoms with intermittent oral steroids, in part because she had refused DMARDS, seeking a natural treatment regimen instead. Her past medical history is significant for psoriasis, which began in her early teen years. However, she has not had a flare of her disease in approximately 30 years. She does recall, however, that she had guttate-type psoriasis, which began following a bout of streptococcal pharyngitis. Her social history is significant for tobacco use disorder, and she drinks alcohol socially. On physical exam, she's healthy appearing, mildly anxious. Her vital signs are within normal limits, and her skin is clear. However, she does have several fingernails with pitting. Her joint examination shows inflammatory changes in several MCP, PIP, and DIP joints in her hands. She also has a mild knee effusion. Her swollen joint count is 12, and her tender joint count is 16. Serologic studies reveal a significantly elevated CRP of 9.1, whereas her ANA, rheumatoid factor, and anti-CCP antibodies are all negative. What is your best diagnosis for this patient at this time? A, undifferentiated inflammatory arthritis and psoriasis. B, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. C, reactive arthritis and psoriasis. Or D, psoriatic arthritis. The best answer in this patient, we believed, was psoriatic arthritis although this may not be an absolute definitive answer, and it's reasonable to categorize the patient as undifferentiated inflammatory arthritis and psoriasis. But let's talk about psoriatic arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis is a chronic seronegative inflammatory arthritis that is associated with psoriasis. A rheumatoid factor is negative in the vast majority of patients. Psoriatic arthritis will develop in approximately 20 to 35 percent of all patients with psoriasis, and it affects men and women equally. The age of onset is typically between 30 and 50 years, with a median age of onset of 35 years. Importantly, psoriatic arthritis will begin in the majority of patients after the onset of cutaneous psoriasis, with some studies showing that this pattern occurs in upwards of 85% of all patients with psoriasis. There are small subsets of patients who will develop psoriatic arthritis coincident with the onset of cutaneous psoriasis or even before the onset of cutaneous psoriasis, though most will develop it after. And in studies looking at the temporal onset of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, it has been found that there can be a delay between the onset of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis that on average can be as high as 12 years. So patients with psoriasis need to continuously be monitored for new onset joint pain that may signify psoriatic arthritis. Unfortunately, psoriatic arthritis is relatively poorly understood at this point in time. It remains a clinical diagnosis, and there are no serologic markers that will allow us to make a definitive diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Additionally, it has a heterogeneous presentation, and this adds to challenges in making a diagnosis. Luckily, however, it is currently 
an area of intense study and hopefully making a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis becomes easier in the future. As of now, the most well-accepted criteria for diagnosing psoriatic arthritis are the CASPER criteria, or classification criteria for psoriatic arthritis. These are mainly used in research settings, but can be used in an everyday clinic to help make a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis, especially in challenging cases. Utilizing the CASPER criteria first requires that a patient has evidence of an inflammatory arthritis. Once that is established, then five clinical criteria are assessed and patients are awarded points based on their presence or absence. And the first clinical criteria is, does the patient have psoriasis? If the patient currently has psoriasis, he or she is given two points. And if the patient has a history or even a family history of psoriasis, they're awarded one point. If the patient has the presence of psoriatic nail dystrophy in terms of pitting, onycholysis, or hyperkeratosis, they're awarded one point. For a negative rheumatoid factor, they're awarded one point. If the patient has dactylitis or a history of dactylitis, they're awarded one point. And finally, if there is radiologic evidence of juxtaarticular new bone formation, otherwise known as fluffy periostitis, the patient is awarded one point. And these points are added up, and if the patient has at least a total of three points, then he or she is set to meet criteria for a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Our patient had a history of psoriasis, presence of psoriatic nail pitting, as well as a negative rheumatoid factor, which gave her a total of three points and a qualification for a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Which of the following clinical features of psoriasis correlates best with risk of progression to psoriatic arthritis? A, pulmoplantar pustulosis, B, older age at onset of psoriasis, C, nail involvement, or D, erythroderma, which implies the patient is covered with psoriasis at least 90% of his or her body surface area. The best answer here is nail involvement. Over the years, there have been numerous studies where researchers have tried to identify clinical features in cohorts of patients with psoriasis that would predict later onset of psoriatic arthritis. And in any given cohort, there are typically several clinical features that are found to be significant. And some of these features in given cohorts have included psoriasis in specific anatomic locations, such as the scalp, involvement of multiple sites, or greater body surface area involvement. However, the one clinical feature that has been found reproducibly in multiple cohorts is the presence of nail dystrophy. And in fact, there are some psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis experts who believe that it is almost impossible to have psoriatic arthritis in a DIP joint without having nail dystrophy given the proximity of that joint space to the nail matrix. Importantly, however, all of these studies done so far have had certain limitations, and it is difficult to say definitively that the presence of nail dystrophy will imply the later onset of psoriatic arthritis. Once a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis is made, there are a number of different treatment options available, and the aggressiveness of treatment will depend on the number of joints involved, the severity of joint involvement in terms of any evidence of joint erosions or other destructive changes, and other features of psoriatic disease, including the amount of skin psoriasis and the location of cutaneous psoriasis, and uh, the overall pattern of psoriatic arthritis, as well as other comorbidities. Our patient, after a discussion with her, agreed to DMAR treatment, and she was initiated on methotrexate 20 milligrams weekly, as well as prednisone 10 milligrams daily. And her joint symptoms improved. However, at three months, she still had evidence of active tenosynovitis, 
And in addition, she expressed a desire to discontinue methotrexate because she feared that over time it would be bad for her liver. Which of the following therapies would you initiate next in this patient? A, continue the methotrexate alone. B, methotrexate plus add another steroid taper. C, continue methotrexate but add an anti-TNF inhibitor. Or D, add anti-TNF therapy as monotherapy. We chose to add anti-TNF therapy as monotherapy in respect to patients wish to discontinue the methotrexate. She was started on etanercept 50 milligrams once weekly, and the methotrexate as well as the prednisone were stopped. And three months after initiating etanercept, she had outstanding control of her joint symptoms. However, now she began to complain of a progressively worsening rash on her trunk, hands, and feet. And in addition, she noted that areas where she would inject her etanercite on the thigh would turn into what looked like psoriasis. Her vital signs, however, were within normal limits, and review of symptoms was otherwise negative except for her skin abnormalities. And here's the patient on physical examination. On the left, you can see a photograph of her trunk, and she has a spattering of erythematous papules, some of which display thick white scale overlying. And on the right, on her palms and soles, she developed reddish-brown macules as well as some pustules that, upon rupturing, would develop into scaly, eroded plaques. Which would be the best option for the patient at this time? A, stop the anti-TNF inhibitor. B, continue with anti-TNF inhibitor therapy and treat the rash. C, consult dermatology and continue anti-TNF inhibitor therapy. Or D, consult dermatology and stop anti-TNF inhibitor therapy. The decision was made to consult dermatology and continue anti-TNF inhibitor therapy for several reasons. One, it was unclear to the treating rheumatologist what exactly this rash represented. And the decision to continue anti-TNF inhibitor therapy for the time being was made because the patient had normal vital signs, no concerning symptoms on review of symptoms, evaluation, and because it was doing a very good job at controlling her inflammatory joint disease. The patient was evaluated by a dermatologist, and the diagnosis of TNF inhibitor-induced psoriasis was given based on the patient's history, clinical findings, and current treatment. TNF-induced psoriasis is a psoriasiform dermatitis that is precipitated by TNF inhibitor therapy, despite the fact that these therapies are used often to treat some of the most severe cases of psoriasis. This is a unique reaction that has an incidence rate of 1 to 3 per 1,000 person years, and in some cohorts, up to 5% of all patients exposed to TNF inhibitor therapy have developed this reaction. It has been reported to have a female predominance with the average age of patients who develop this reaction in the 40s. However, this may simply be because female patients in their 40s are the most likely to be prescribed TNF inhibitor therapy because of the diseases for which these medications are approved to treat. And this seems to be a class effect. It has essentially been reported in all TNF inhibitors that are available. TNF inhibitor-induced psoriasis typically is identified in patients who are treated with TNF inhibitors for conditions other than psoriasis, and usually they have no history of psoriasis. However, again, this may simply be because in patients who have known psoriasis, this is more challenging to diagnose, and clinicians may simply believe that the patient is no longer responding to the TNF inhibitor, and that is why they have a psoriasiform rash. This reaction can occur at any time during the course of 
TNF inhibitor therapy from the first injection to years after the patient has been successfully using the medicine. And a mean time to onset has been reported at approximately 9 to 15 months after initiation of TNF inhibitor therapy. The psoriatic lesions that arise on the patient mimic the morphologies of various subtypes of idiopathic psoriasis, with plaque type and pulmoplantar postulosis being the most common seen. And there is a particularly high percentage of pulmoplantar postulosis that is seen in the setting of TNF inhibitor-induced psoriasis compared to idiopathic psoriasis. And these patients may also present with scalp psoriasis that is associated with significant alopecia, which is uncommon in the setting of idiopathic psoriasis. Again, this reaction can occur in patients who are treated with TNF inhibitors for their psoriasis and clues that this is actually what is occurring in these patients would be the onset of psoriatic lesions in anatomic locations where the patient did not have psoriasis before initiation of treatment and psoriasis that represents a new subtype compared to what the patient had in the past. For our patient, she did have guttate psoriasis in the past and seemed to have had that this time, but she also developed pulmoplantar postulosis, which was a subtype that she did not have in the past. And importantly, the appearance of the psoriasiform rash has no significance in terms of the ability of the underlying disease for which the TNF inhibitor was prescribed to continue responding to that medicine. And that was seen in our patient. Despite the fact she developed a psoriasiform rash, her joint disease remained very well controlled with the Tanercept. The histologic characteristics of TNF-induced psoriasis can vary somewhat, but most commonly they show histologic features by and large identical to psoriasis with the caveat that there are often eosinophils and plasma cells within the inflammatory infiltrate, and that would be uncommon in idiopathic psoriasis, and so these can serve as a clue to diagnosis. Under any circumstance or pattern of histology, the clinical impression of the physician performing the biopsy is typically that the rash looks like psoriasis. Here is our patient's biopsy, and it did show histologic features of psoriasis, thickening of the stratum corneum uh, with hyperplasia of the epidermis to a regular degree, and an inflammatory infiltrate that, when viewed upon higher power, revealed numerous eosinophils, these uh, red cells with one to two nuclei in this photomicrograph. The pathogenesis of TNF-induced psoriasis is unknown. However, it is hypothesized that it is due to a disruption of cytokine balance that is triggered by TNF-alpha blockade. And more specifically, it is hypothesized that there is unopposed interferon alpha production by plasmacytoid dendritic cells that drives psoriasiform inflammation. Under normal circumstances, plasmacytoid dendritic cell maturation and thus their ability to produce interferon alpha is inhibited by TNF alpha, but when TNF alpha is blocked, there is no inhibition and plasmacytoid dendritic cells mature and produce interferon alpha unimposed. And there is some evidence that this hypothesis is true in that expression of MXA, which is a marker for type 1 interferon production, has been found to be higher in tissue specimens of TNF inhibitor-induced psoriasis compared to specimens of idiopathic psoriasis. Additionally, there is some evidence that in TNF-induced psoriasis, there's also increased expression of chemokine receptors within the epidermis, and this expression may facilitate homing of autoreactive T lymphocytes to the skin. The disease course in patients who develop TNF-induced psoriasis is completely variable. In some patients, they their reaction may resolve without any need for treatment and they're able to stay on their TNF inhibitor, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, some patients even have their psoriasiform lesions persist despite stopping the TNF inhibitor.
and there are no predictive factors in terms of the severity, the morphologic subtype of psoriasis that develops, or the anatomic distribution uh, in terms of the course the patient will have. What does seem to be true is that because this is a class effect, the reaction will often recur if you simply switch from one TNF inhibitor to another. Concomitant treatment with which of the following at time of initiating TNF-alpha inhibition can effectively prevent TNF-induced psoriasis? A, phototherapy, B, cyclosporin, C, topical vitamin D analogs, D, methotrexate, or E, none of the above? The answer here is none of the above. Patients can develop TNF-induced psoriasis despite being on combination therapy with methotrexate and TNF inhibitors or any of the combinations listed here. In terms of treatment, for a patient like ours who had a, a severe reaction, if the psoriasis is significant and is having adverse effects on the patient's quality of life, and the TNF inhibitor is ineffectively treating the underlying disease, then it's reasonable to stop the TNF inhibitor and try another treatment. However, if the TNF inhibitor is effectively treating the underlying disease for which it was prescribed and the psoriasis is significant, then it's reasonable to try to attempt to treat the psoriasiform eruption in order to salvage treating the underlying disease with the TNF inhibitor. And the treatments that can be utilized mimic the treatments that we use for idiopathic psoriasis. And of course, the aggressiveness depends on the severity of the reaction and can range from topical medicines to uh, various steroid sparing immunosuppressive agents. No treatment modality thus far has been associated with severe, superior results for treating TNF induced psoriasis. For our patient, once dermatology was consulted, the patient was started on topical medicines, and phototherapy was planned. In addition to the topical medicines, however, it was not covered by insurance. The patient refused to take other DMARDs, such as methotrexate or cyclosporin. The rash persisted, and the patient continued to note discomfort with activities of daily living due to her rash despite good control of her joint disease. What is the next best possible step? A, switch to another TNF inhibitor. B, switch to an IL-1223 inhibitor. C, switch to an IL-17 inhibitor. D, B, or C. The answer here is B or C. If the psoriasiform eruption persists and Despite significant treatment, there is a need to stop the TNF inhibitor, then biologic agents that utilize alternative mechanisms of action can be considered, including IL-1223 inhibitors like ustekinumab or IL-17 inhibitors like secakinumab. Both of these agents are FDA approved to treat both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and importantly, no medicine in either one of these classes has been associated with an adverse triggering of psoriasiform dermatitis like the TNF-alpha inhibitors are known to cause. Again, it is an option to switch to another TNF inhibitor, but this seems to be effective in only the minority of cases, and typically the patient will have a recurrence or persistence of the psoriasiform eruption, so it's likely not the best option. This photograph is taken from a paper published in the journal Gut in 2013, which reported on a cohort of patients with inflammatory bowel disease who developed TNF-induced psoriasis on TNF inhibitors and were switched to ustekinumab. And here, a patient in the left-hand column, you can see this erythematous rash in her scalp, and in the lower left photograph, associated alopecia in the midline of her scalp. And in comparison on the right, once she was switched to ustekinumab, the eruption has resolved. Her alopecia has also resolved, and luckily the patient's inflammatory bowel disease was well-controlled on ustekinumab.
So our patient did start use to Kinumab, and her skin disease resolved, and luckily her joint disease remained very well controlled, and she continues on this medicine to this day. So in terms of dermatology and rheumatology co-management, we have found that this optimizes care for patients with complex inflammatory diseases like psoriatic disease, and patients really appreciate the cooperation and the communication between specialists in different disciplines. Our co-management also fosters a collaboration that helps involve clinicians from either discipline gain insights into different aspects of these complex diseases, and it also creates an environment that fosters research opportunities that hopefully will expand our understanding of these complex chronic inflammatory diseases and eventually lead to better treatments. So in summary, psoriatic arthritis can be challenging to diagnose. TNF-induced psoriasis is a recognized adverse class effect of TNF inhibitors. Treatment of TNF-induced psoriasis depends on the severity of the reaction and the effectiveness of the TNF inhibitor. And finally, cooperation between dermatology and rheumatology can optimize outcomes of patients with complex inflammatory disease. Thank you for your attention.